are these people? This is going to be an interesting story, I feel, Colin. Um, so we've been seeing a lot of Islamophobia, I feel, recently. And mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of go through um, the ignorance of that. Um, so Craig Murray uh, writes, in response to the online hate and propaganda he is witnessing, the author tells a brief story that took place in Lahore, Pakistan, about a fortnight ago, right? And we're seeing this in regards to Iranians too. I saw, I saw today people were were uh, complaining about that. But anyway, Craig Murray, like like this right here, right? This guy, you know, Lisa Debenko. You can already tell it's going to be a terrible tweet by these two flags being in it. Um, right. <laughs> burn hell, you Shahid supporting Islamic bastard backing Hamas and Hezbollah. Justice serves. Right. You know, and if you're if you're out here, guy just died. I mean, let the brave get a little cold, would you? You know, just a little bit. Right. Um, Kit Clarenberg, who just made it back on Twitter. Good for you, Clarenberg. Good looking out. Says Financial Times contributor. Um, in case you were wondering what kind of people are at the Financial Times. But Craig Murray continues. Um, the deluge, the deluge of Islamophobia, like we saw earlier on social media unleashed by supporters of the Gaza genocide, have been profoundly shocking. There's one reason I am very sorry that Hosba Yusuf was forced out as first minister of Scotland, as he was a particular target and his ousting will have encouraged the bigot. On Twitter and Facebook, I frequently received comments suggesting that I should go and live in an Islamic country from people evidently unaware that I have previously, or that I should meet Hamas or the Taliban from people, again, unaware that I have previously who would behead me or that Muslims wish to kill all not, all Muslims. Craig Murray, if you're watching, uh, I do believe you still have your head on your shoulders, so that didn't happen. Right. Also, fun fact, I visited Morocco. I visited Jordan. Oh, nice. Yes. Very lovely yes. places I hear. Very so... lovely, and and because it's the idea, and I kind of saw this on Twitter earlier today, that uh, gen uh, some some ch blue chat mark made a comment that Arabs do not like black people. Uh, very general statement. And I was just kind of like, well, I know plenty of Arab people and I've been to the Arab world and they were extremely pleasant uh, and extremely hospitable to me, you know, when I visited, you know, yeah. both Morocco and Jordan. So, yep. so not sure, not, not my experience at least. Well, it's also you know, with your, the other, you know, group you're a part of, the LGBT, right? They always tell them to go over there too, right? You know, they don't, they don't like you over there. We've shown how that's not the case either, you know? Right. So, but yeah, so... Which, uh, Craig Murray continues, what strikes me curiously is the sincerity of their Islamophobic beliefs. They really do believe these things because they have been imbued with this hate by absorbing years of propaganda in which Muslims are dehumanized. Uh, Craig wants to tell you and them a small story. In Pakistan a fortnight ago, I was in Lahore searching for the house of General Allard, where Alexander Burnus spent time. Allard is a fascinating figure, but I do not want to digress here from the point. I did not find Allard's palatial residence, which had been demolished long ago, but I did find the tomb where he and his daughter were buried. The tomb was attached to the house, and my friend Masood Lahari and I were able to do some urban archaeology, discovering that elements of this palace and its outbuildings have been incorporated into much later structures now on the site. We were walking around the dense buildings when a man got off his scooter and invited, invited us into a doorway. Masood told him what we were doing, and he invited us up many winding steps to his attic apartment, where he opened a trap door into a roof cavity that revealed a very old structure. His attic apartment was clean, but very sparsely furnished. It had two rooms, in one of which his invalid father lay on a bed, in the other, he and his wife had their bed. There were plastic chairs and a table, and an incongruously large old fridge. His wife produced dates and nuts and tea, 
and insist we sit down to drink. The fridge was open, mm -hmm. and the entire contents were emptied out for us. There was a delicious half yeah. melon, which was diced and put into bowls. A handful of strawberries were crushed and whipped up with milk. Bread was broken, and the very small amount of meat diced and grilled. We tried to refuse some of the hospitality, but plainly to persist no, in that. Can't do it. It would have caused enormous <laughs> offense. It was obvious that this was a household that, by Western standards, was living in great poverty, but every single bit yeah. of food available was cleaned out and given to the guests. Our beaming hosts told us of the blessings they received in providing hospitality to strangers. The yeah. Point that, is, and, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, that's was that was my experience, you know, in the like I I will argue that's the experience generally in the global south. Like and and I think it mostly it's because you know, in my travels in the Middle East and Africa, it's the idea that people people recognize generally you're coming a long way. Yeah, You know, and the idea is like, you can go anywhere around the world, but you're choosing to go to them. To right. them, that's a very big deal. So well, I think it's a very will... working class thing too, right? Like, because yes. food is available to you as uh, like, and not to, it's a very, I mean, it's here in the South too, right? You know, tea mm -hmm. and, and, and biscuits are going to be out. Like, you know, we're going to find something to feed you with if you're here. So, right. So. You know, but it's the idea of like we want to present us in a way that is kind of pleasing to you in that yeah. regard. But I think it's also just the idea of like it's the honoring of you taking the time to come into their country, their town, what whatever, to be a witness to what um what the country or the people or the culture are like. So right. like basically, you know, like when I was in Morocco and especially in Jordan, uh, in the part where I was, um, you know, they were basically like, if you need anything, like they could be working or whatever, but they were basically like, if you need anything, here's my number. Call <laughs> me. For no, no, seriously, right. like it, they will drop everything for you, yeah. like. But they will want to make sure that they. But essentially, they want to make sure that you are having the best possible time as possible. And and again, as a black person, like uh, Arab um, hospitality is top notch, at least yeah. in the times that I visit. So well, the idea Craig Murray that agrees yeah, with ahead. you um, mm -hmm. that as he's experienced often in Muslim countries, it is typical that Muslim people behave. It is, for example, a fact that the UK Muslims devote a much higher proportion of their income to charity than non-Muslims. Hate is bred of fear, and fear is bred of ignorance. It is tragic that in developed countries, resources are available for war, but not to counter that ignorance. But of course, the hate is deliberately inculcated and it is required to bolster support for war. From war, the establishment makes a great deal of money and foment yet more hatred from which to bolster their authority. Especially when they send their kids to die, right? Um, yeah. But I, I wanted to point out, this is the kind of stuff that brings this about, right? So this is a former MI5 agent, Annie Macon. I guess that's how you would do that. Let's match in Macon. Details how the Mossad set up a false flag. Yeah, bombed the Israeli embassy in London in 1994 and got two prominent Palestinian activists to take the plane. Right, so I'm going to let her tell uh, it. But the two cases that really got us, first of all, there was a, a false flag attack in London in 1994 where a car bomb exploded outside the Israeli embassy in the centre of London. 
Now, I remember this vaguely.、Mm. This is, we're talking 14 years ago. It's a long time but ago. But it was huge at the time. I mean, it was a huge worldwide story. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there'd been、um, an earlier attack against some Jewish interest section in Buenos Aires earlier that year as well. Similar、uh-huh. sort of MO,、um, modus operandi, with a car bomb driven and parked outside that exploded. Very minor injuries, that was all.、Okay. Nobody was killed. And、um, it was a very sophisticated device. It appeared to eat itself, eat all the forensics. Now, this is very, very rare. Even the IRA, which is a very sophisticated terrorist organization, could not make bombs that、um, effective.、Um, so it looked like a you know, sort of fairly technical person had put that together. But what emerged from that,、um, the senior MI5 officer who was in charge of the investigation into it、um, and had seen all the evidence, but also all the intelligence, which isn't necessarily admissible in court, wrote his formal assessment at the end of the case. And he said he reckoned that Mossad. The Israeli External Intelligence Agency had bombed their own embassy, a sort of extro-、uh, controlled explosion outside the embassy. And as I said, that was a senior MI5 officer. That was his formal verdict. If you read that on the internet now, you would say that sounds like some mad conspiracy theory. But it wasn't. This was the official position of MI5. And he said that they did it for two reasons. One, they were always hassling MI5 for increased security around their embassy and other interests in London, because, of course, London. Had a, a reputation of giving safe haven to Arab distance from around the world at that point. And MI5 kept saying, well, there's no reason to increase the threat assessment. You don't need extra protection. So, letting off a controlled explosion outside, of course, they immediately got what they wanted there. But crucially, two innocent Palestinians were arrested, charged, and convicted of conspiracy to cause that attack. And they were very active in a Palestinian support. Network in London, political campaigning for the people on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And they were gaining some traction in the media. They were getting quite a lot of support. So, by arresting these people and framing them for an attack and sticking them in prison, the whole network just shattered and hasn't got back on its feet to this day. So, that would be a clear political advantage. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I think stokes that Islamophobia, right? We've、mm-hmm. talked about time and time again these kind of false flag attacks. You know, from the、uh, Olympics that, you know, were, were attacked, you know, hostage situation, that kind of stuff.、Um, I think that was in Germany, right? If I'm not mistaken. I think so, yeah.、Um, so, but I wanted to bring that as just an example of one of the many ways they stoked this kind of fear, especially during the Iraq War, stuff like that. It was all over the place, right? Um,、mm-hmm. you know, especially after 9 11. But I, I brought this video, uh, Colin. This is from the NPS finals in 2016. Okay. Right. And,、uh, you know,、uh, slam poetry, Colin. You got to love it. Like bongos, all that fun stuff. It's very lovely. But you heard my reaction to this last night and you were like, what's that? And you're like, oh, you'll see. Right? I, right? This is going to be good. So just strap in.、Um, you know, again, Poetry Slam Inc. Look, Poetry Slam, I think it's important to play this. So if you want to take, you know, just don't strike us, is all I'm asking. Please. You know, important message getting out here.、Um, so if I can full screen it, that would be nice.、Um, but let's let these people speak. In Decatur, Georgia. On June 17, 2015, Dylan Ruff walked into a midweek Bible study. He sat and prayed with the church members before pulling out his gun, killing most, and allowing one to live. After the incident, he was found and arrested peacefully. When Dylan Ruff killed nine innocent black people, we did not question his God. He wore flags of apartheid Africa. We did not question his allegiance. He committed the crime alone. We did not question his people. When Adam Lanza shot a classroom full of first graders at Sandy Hook Elementary, we did not ask him to leave the country. When Timothy McVeigh killed 168 people in Oklahoma, we did not call this a crime against every American. When the KKK killed thousands of black people, While swearing to uphold Christian morality, we did not ask them to remove their robes. We did not call all Christians bigots. Do you see it? 
How we don't label all white men based on the sins of a few, do you see it? How we don't have to condemn a whole class of people based on the actions of some, do you see it? How all the names are different, how all the faces are different, how all the people are different, therefore, we should not condemn all Muslims for the radicalism of a group. If you want to persecute ISIS, go ahead, but to persecute ISIS is to persecute those that gave them power, to persecute those that gave them power is to persecute the U.S. government, do your research. Islam is not synonymous with terror, it is literally submission, it is devotion, it is peace. Terrorism is actually forbidden and jihad does not mean holy war, it means struggle, it means survival, it means standing face to face with everything that wants to put you in the ground and choosing to be alive. Do your research and stop listening to CNN. Stop trading humanity for hypocrisy. Stop staring at Muslims in the airport. Stop letting your fear drag you into ignorance. Stop supporting billionaire Republicans who want to scare you into murdering the innocent and start supporting leaders who speak peace in their native tongue. Instead of burning down the mosques, burn down the walls around the pulsating muscle in your chest and realize that we all have one. And lastly, as, As the, the customary, customary greeting goes, goes Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Wa alaikum assalam, and upon you be peace. Do you see it? <laughs> Dude, holy shit. Let that, share that. Please. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'll be on it. Oh. Yeah, that Desert killed Mads me last night. To me. Desert so, Mads agreed. <laughs> yeah. Um talking about this is why we're why we're demonetized. So, you know. You know what to do. I don't go, think to, to, go to I skin don't think this. We'll get demonetized for that. I we might be. Um code com slash indie news network, you know. Put exclamation mark donate in the chat, scan the QR code, help us out monetarily. We appreciate it. Um, you know, share, like, comment, let us know what you think. You know, so lot, there's a lot going on with that one. 